So I hope you're all ready for a super cheery and happy sermon today. <laughs> uh, I am going to be talking a bit about tragedy, and we're going to look at some people facing tragedies in the Bible, but I promise not to let it get too doom and gloom for you all. Uh, Courtney already read one of our scriptures for us today uh, from John 11, where Jesus is, finds out about his good friend Lazarus' death and is mourning the loss of his friend. Now, Jesus will then proceed to bring Lazarus back from the dead. But he's still, for that moment where he finds out Lazarus is gone, is facing that tragedy that most of us, probably all of us, have faced at some point, the loss of a loved one. Uh, now, we're also going to look at a couple other people uh, back in the Old Testament. So we got our good friend Job, who, if you haven't ever looked into the book of Job and his story, it is quite a roller coaster. And it's a really interesting book because the middle section of it was actually written first before the beginning and the end. Uh, there's the beginning where you have this back and forth between God and the devil, between God and Satan, and the end where uh, Job, spoiler alert, gets his really, really good life back, but even better. But there's this middle section where Job, this really, really righteous person, in fact, so righteous that everyone knows he is favored by God, that he has all of these children, all of these uh, flocks of animals, wealthy, and he's just this really, really righteous guy, and he loses everything. His family, his wealth, his flocks, his health, all of it stripped away. And the beginning and end were written later to sort of explain that middle, uh, that middle part where he loses it all. So it's a really interesting book uh, that I'm only going to get into just a little bit of it here. But if you've never read Job before, I highly encourage you to take a look at it. And then we're also going to talk about Naomi. Uh, now that's in the book of Ruth, because it's about Ruth and Naomi. And Naomi is Ruth's mother-in-law. And that book is about their story together. But we're going to mo mostly focus on Naomi at the beginning of the book of Ruth. So let's take a look, first of all, jump back to Job. And I'm going to go to Job chapter 10. And I'm going to start off with the very first verse in that. And you'll see that Job handles losing everything in his life really, really well. I loathe my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in bitterness of my soul. So if we jump down a little bit further in that same chapter... He ends with, why did you bring me forth from the womb? Would that I had died before any eye had seen me, and were as though I had not been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not these days of my life few? Let me alone that I may find a little comfort before I go, never to return, to the land of gloom and deep darkness, the land of gloom and chaos, where light is like darkness. So that's Job for you. And now if we look at Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 1, we'll hear a little bit from Naomi. And Naomi starts off, her husband dies, and then her two sons die. And that's where we start the book of Ruth. But Elamica, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The names of one was Opa, Opa, Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died. So that the women were left, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. But Naomi said to her two daughters in laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you, grant that you may find sanctuary, security, each of you in the house of your husband. 
Then she kisses them, and they wept aloud. So here, again, is another instance of someone losing everything because, well, women were essentially treated as property back then, and property couldn't own other property. So when your husband died, then you would be taken into the care of your sons. Well, then when your sons die, you're supposed to go to the next male relative, and that could be someone you may have never even met before. So Naomi had no idea what was coming. All of her husband's stuff, all of her son's stuff would have been also left to that next male relative. So she is now without anything, and she's without any way to provide for her daughter-in-laws. That is why she tells them to, to, go, to go find new husbands. They're still young. They could still have a life, basically, is what she's telling them, and is sending them away. So tragedies. They're all over in the Bible, and they're all throughout our lives, and that's why I kind of wanted to talk about them today. Because as a nation, I've felt, you know, it feels like we're, we keep getting hit by these tragedies with the two hurricanes coming through so quickly together, and there's all these political ads every five seconds that are trying to make you think that our world is on the brink of destruction. It feels like around every corner there's another tragedy. And then on more, a more personal scale, it always feels like we are just going from one tragedy to the next, almost. With little breaks in between them, little glimpses of joy and happiness. But there's always something just around the corner. Maybe you're in the midst of it right now. Maybe you just got through one. And maybe you're about to get stuck in another one. But wherever you are in that journey, there's always something you can relate to there. Because we all go through them. They come in different forms, different sizes. They come at different times in our lives. But all throughout history, all throughout the Bible, all across the news today, we see that struggling with tragedy is just a part of living in this world. And we look at these three Bible passages where we have Jesus, Naomi, and Job. And what do these three passages have in common is that these three people are all in the midst of dealing with a tragedy. So when we look at them, we see that even when you're with God, even when you're following God, believing in God, that doesn't protect you or prevent you from facing tragedies because the reality is we live in an imperfect world. We know this. We know that ever since Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, people have made mistakes. We got that stupid thing called free will that lets us mess up, right? And ever since then, our world has been imperfect. And yet, when those tragedies hit, we still often will think, why did God do this to me? Why did God let this happen to me? Even though we know that is just a result of living in the world that we're in. And while you can't avoid tragedies by any means, you can, at the very least, control how you respond in the midst of those tragedies. There are many different ways that we see people respond, many different ways we ourselves respond to tragedies. So I want to think about how should we respond. How does God want us to respond in those difficult times? You know, do we, do we question why did God let this happen? Do we lose faith? Do we get mad at God? Do we get mad at the world? at someone else, at ourselves? Do we go and cry out in anguish? Do we plead for something else? Do we try taking control of what we can? Do we send others away and isolate ourselves? Or do we try to forget and just pretend that it's not there? Or do we say, it's okay. Everything is completely fine because I believe in God. So I'm completely fine. And then jump for joy because of our unwavering trust in God. Remember that 
we are in church right now. So if you're thinking, yeah, that's the one I do, you're not supposed to lie in church. (laughs) There are lots of ways we might respond in times of tragedy. And sometimes I think people believe that that last one, jumping for joy, saying it's all okay, is how we're supposed to as Christians. When in reality, that's not the case. And that's not what the Bible shows us. In today's scriptures, we encountered several different individuals who are grappling with anguish and loss, tragedies and despairs. These stories from Job, Naomi, and even Jesus offer us insights into this human suffering that we all experienced. And more importantly, it offers us insights into how we might respond when faced with tragedies in our own lives. These three show us a whole range of human emotions, from bitterness and despair to resilience and hope, but even more, they point us to how God is present, present with us, even in our darkest moments. Let's go back to Job for a moment. Job, like I said, gets everything taken away from him. His wealth, his livestock, his family, his health, everything. And Job is the most righteous follower of God. That is why later when they wrote that beginning and end, they have the devil decide to target him to begin with because he wants to test God's most righteous, devout follower. And God says, go ahead. And so the devil, devil causes all of these horrible things to happen to Job. And how does Job respond? He doesn't say, it's all right. I still have my faith. I still have God. I know everything's going to be okay. Not even Job, the most righteous person, responds like that. Job cries out in anguish and says, I loathe my life. He is suffering so greatly at this point that he hates his own life. He hates that he was even born. In Job 10, we see a man who is utterly devastated by what life has brought him. And Job does not hold back his feelings. He does not hold back from sharing what it is he's going through. He speaks with that bitterness, asking why he was even born in life if it was only to bring him such misery. Job is one of the most honest voices that we can hear in scripture when it comes to suffering. His lament reveals something essential to us as believers that when we're going through that, when we cry out to God, why, why is this happening? God can handle our pain. God can even handle our complaints. There are times when tragedies hit us and we feel like Job, lost in this place of utter darkness where even the light feels like darkness. And when we encounter those moments of despair, it's, it's important to remember that God doesn't ask us to hide our emotions. In fact, scripture gives us that permission, that space to lament, to bring our brokenness there before God and to even question it. And that's okay. It's in this raw honesty that we open up that door for eventual healing. If we look back at Naomi again, she has also lost everything. She has no way to care for herself, no way to care for her daughters. But she trusts that God will provide for the three of them, right? Nope. She tries to send her daughter-in-laws away because she thinks that God will provide for them, but not for her. Naomi doubts that God is even there still with her. But as we see in Ruth chapter one, even while Naomi is in this time of great sorrow, even while she is doubting God's very presence after losing her two sons and her husband without sending even when sending away her very last family that she knows, believing that there's nothing left for her, God is still present with her. In Naomi's grief, 
If we were to continue with that scripture, we would see a glimmer of hope in that her daughter-in-law, Ruth, refuses to leave her side. In the midst of tragedy, we often find God in the places that, and the people that God places in our lives to support us, to walk with us when we feel abandoned. Naomi may not even be able to see it yet, but we can see how God is still present even when she doesn't see it through Ruth's constant faith and support in her mother-in-law. And then we look at Jesus, right? The son of God, the Lord made flesh, who literally came here to show us what it is to be perfect, to show us what we should strive to be, even if we'll never quite make it. And surely he responds to tragedy, the loss of his friend, his brother Lazarus, He responds with acceptance and grace, right? This unwavering faithfulness in God, in God's plan. Not this Jesus. In the wake of losing a loved one, even Jesus has the most human response and that he weeps. He knows that his friend will be resurrected. He's going to do that. He knows what he's going to do but he still feels the pain of that loss in that moment. This is the one, one of the most powerful moments, I believe, in the Gospels because it shows us a God who is not distant from our suffering. Jesus feels that weight of human grief, and he weeps alongside those who mourn. When we face tragedy, it's important to remember that God does not stand apart in our pain but is instead right there entering into it with us. Jesus shows us that, this, that our sorrow does in fact matter to God. And so we must allow ourselves to experience our emotions, our reactions in their fullest extent and not try to brush them aside and pretend everything's a-okay because sometimes it's not. We gotta feel that pain that hurt, that loss, that sorrow and anguish. And then you allowed God to come with you as you prepare to step out of it. You can get mad, upset, sad, frustrated, whatever it is that rises up in you. And you can even direct it all at God because God's shoulders are big enough to take it but you just don't live in it. You get it out, and then you're ready to, with God's help, move forward. Feeling those emotions to their fullest extent and then letting go. And you can, like I said, even direct it at God as long as you acknowledge eventually God doesn't make bad things happen to us because we live in an imperfect world and that's just a part of life. But God does come alongside us and help us through. And eventually, as you go through that suffering, that pain, you remember that it is okay to smile. It's okay to be happy and then go back to being upset. It's not an all at once immediate transformation of like, oh, I was depressed, but now I'm okay. It's sometimes you have moments of grief. Sometimes you're okay for a bit. Then that grief hits you again. And as time goes on, that grief comes in shorter spurts and there's longer spurts of happiness or joy in between, but it doesn't ever fully go away and that's okay. When tragedy strikes, we often feel lost and confused. Like Job, we may cry out in bitterness. Like Naomi, we might feel that God has even turned against us. But as Christians, we eventually are also called to respond in ways that reflect our faith. You know, first we can lament. 
Like Job, we should feel free to express our pain honestly before God. Lamentation is not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weak faith. It is an act of trust, believing that God hears us even in our darkest moments. This lamenting, it might take a different amount of time, depending on the individual, depending on the tragedy. And Job laments a lot. If you read his book, you'll read a lot of laments. Jesus, not as much, because he can kind of change it very quickly there. But it's important to give you that time and that space to just kind of get it out. While also accepting that eventually you'll need to let go of them. And then second, we must rely on our community around us. Accept that we can't control everything and everyone in those moments. Ruth's loyalty to Naomi shows us that even in the worst of circumstances, God works through the people around us to bring hope back to us, to bring healing. When we walk through tragedy, we aren't meant to do it alone. We have others that God sends us to lean on for support in ways that help us experience God's love and God's showing us the path. Finally, we are called to trust. Even if, when it feels like God is far away, like in Naomi's story, God is still at work. Jesus' weeping reminds us that God is never distant from our pain. And his resurrection powers remind us that even in death, there is hope for a new life. So in the face of tragedy, it is natural to feel overwhelmed. We might feel at times as life is against us, like Job, or that God's hand has turned away, like Naomi. But these scriptures show us that we are not alone in our suffering. God is present in our honest cries and the support of those around us and in the compassionate tears of Christ. Being a Christian doesn't require us to smile through the pain. It doesn't mean we aren't allowed to get upset, angry, or emotional. It just means that in those times where we are, we also know that God is crying alongside us, ready to help us forward when we're ready. And ultimately, our faith calls us to remember that while tragedy and grief are inevitable, they don't have the final words. God walks with us through everything, offering us hope and the promise of resurrection. Amen. Amen. Next week, we're going to get into, instead of how we respond to tragedy, how we respond to others in tragedy. So... That's right. It's a two-parter, folks, and you don't want to miss it.